Hello, and thank you for watching this presentation by the American Iron Society. Please support the organization by becoming a member. Go to irises.org and click on join. Thank you. That uh, tonight's webinar is Exotic Errols, Autumn Bloomers, and the Age of Space, the Iris Legacy of Lloyd Austin, and is presented by Jean Richter. Gene Richter is an AIS master judge, a board member of AIS, and historic and novelty iris enthusiast. She is a former officer of the Historic Iris Preservation Society, former regional vice president for AIS Region 14, and co-president of the Sydney B. Mitchell Iris Society. So welcome, Gene, and it's yours. All right, thank you very much, Gary. Can you hear me okay, everybody? Yes. yes. Great. All right, let me get started here and I will share my screen. Okay. All right, thank you very much. I'm so happy to see so many folks here um, interested in learning about a very unique and interesting man, Lloyd Austin. And you know, the title of my presentation, as Gary said, is Exotic Errols, Autumn Bloomers, and the Age of Space. And those are all terms that he used to talk about Iris in his catalogs. So let's go ahead. And first, I'm going to give you a little bit of biographical information about Lloyd Austin. And I apologize for the not so great quality of this picture. Um, it's the only picture I've ever seen of him as a young man. And the only copy I had of it is a not very great black and white photocopy. But anyway, um, Lloyd Austin was born in 1898 in Westfield, Massachusetts. And then he served in World War I. And then after the war, he made his way to California and uh, went to school at the University of California and graduated in 1920. Um, back then there was only the one. Uh, nowadays there are 10 universities of California and this is the University of California at Berkeley. And he probably met some folks there that would have a uh, profound influence on his later life with irises. And while he was at uh, UC Berkeley, he studied general plant breeding with an emphasis in genetics. And he was mentored and befriended by the um, wonderful hybridizer and plantsman Luther Burbank, even though they were you know, about 50 years difference in ages between the two of them, they became wow. friends. And he used Luther Burbank's methods and accomplishments in his graduation thesis for UC Berkeley. And after graduating, he went on to become an instructor at the College of Agriculture at Davis, what is now known as UC Davis, um, in the pomology department. And those of you out there who may wonder what pomology is, it's the study of fruit and its cultivation, particularly um, pomologists study fruit trees. And since they're closely related, they also study nut trees. And well, he was only at UC Davis for five years, but he um, tremendously built up their collection of fruit tree varieties. Um, they started out with 200. And by the time he left there five years later, they had uh, over a thousand different varieties of fruit trees. And you know, just as he was getting going in his pomology career, um, Luther Burbank actually recommended him to head up the, as the first director of the Eddy Tree Breeding Station in Placerville, California. And uh, Placerville, if you don't know, is located in the uh, Sierra Nevada foothills, just, just east of the San Francisco Bay Area. And so the, the Eddy Tree Breeding Station um, was later known as the Institute of Forest Genetics and was the world's first forest tree breeding station. Now, Mr. Austin led the Institute of Forest Genetics for 14 years. And then I think he eventually became frustrated um, working with forest trees because it's not a thing that you can make substantive changes to on a short time scale. 
And uh, in the autobiography that I have a copy of, um, he said he wanted to work on something that didn't take 150 years to make changes to. So then he started focusing his energies on Iris. And he was briefly associated with um, Carl Salbach, who had an Iris business in the uh, Berkeley area. And he probably encountered him when he was a student at UC Berkeley. And then both uh, Carl Salbach and Sidney B. Mitchell mentored him on Iris breeding. And Sidney B. Mitchell was the head librarian at UC Berkeley, and I'm sure he probably met Lloyd Austin when he was a student there. So both of them per, um, provided invaluable assistance to him when he was getting started, and as we'll see later, um, had a profound effect in how his business would go. So Lloyd Austin's Rainbow Hybridizing Gardens uh, was started in Placerville in 1946. And right away, you can sort of see the focus of what he wants to do by calling his business Hi Rainbow Hybridizing Gardens. He was very interested in hybridizing. And so he ran the business starting in 1946 and then uh, unfortunately suddenly passed away in 1963. Uh, his widow Gladys Austin kept the business going for several years, and then uh, Rainbow Hybridizing Gardens uh, ended as a business in 1966. So let's take a look at the very first Lloyd Austin catalog. This is his 1946 Rainbow Offerings. And as you can see, he didn't just sell iris at the beginning. He also sold gladiolus and lilies and unusual seeds. And one of the things that uh, Mr. Austin really wanted to focus on with his iris business was not so much the, you know, the common things like tall bearded iris. He was interested in, let's say, the more uncommon or exotic um, types of iris. And his catalogs are really special, I think, in the iris world. Um, they were just chock full of information. And uh, he had a lot of information on for potential hybridizers on things like fertility of different varieties. And he published guidebooks and manuals on how to do hybridizing and how to grow iris. And they were really a treasure trove of information. And here's a sample of another catalog um, from later on in the life of the business in 1962. And the really fascinating thing about his catalogs is not only did they have just tons and tons of information in them, but everything was, as time went on, overlaid with this sort of corny hucksterism for lack of a better term. As you can see, in, uh, by 1962, it was Lloyd Austin's world-famous iris color guidebook, your year-round iris bloom in the garden of your dreams. So you know, he, he did have a little bit of a tendency towards exaggeration about some things. Um, and he used lots of different ways to you know, keep the customers, customers interested in going through his catalog. Um, he had you know, various things like the secret variety game, which was a way that you could get discounts on various iris and you had to basically pour through the entire huge dense catalogs looking for words that had an extra capital letter at the end of them. And those were the secret varieties that you could get a discount on. And there were also these super secret varieties, which had two off weird capital letters in them, descriptions. And so you see sort of a juxtaposition of these various things. He has, he's selling hybridizers kits and he had a whole column devoted to hybridizing. He sold um, pollinated Irish, Irish seeds, which is very unusual. And at the same time, you've got the secret variety games and sweepstakes coupons. And so if, in case you're wondering what the secret variety game looked like, here's an example of a description of Argus pheasant, a very famous Dykes medal winning iris from uh, the 1940s. And as you can see, the description, um, exceptionally large with a bogus capital E in it, which said that was a secret variety. And I suspect that a lot of these secret varieties were things that grew very well, so he had extra stock of. So this was his way of, you know, dispersing some of his extra stock. So another thing 
that was uh, very notable about Austin catalogs is the color accuracy of them. Um, a lot of the, nearly all of the pictures had extremely accurate color and were really nice depictions of the flowers. You know, here, for example, is an aerial iris called Iris Lortetii. And it's a you know, very beautiful picture and very nice, accurate color. And in fact, a lot of these aerial species um, that he entered, that either he introduced or he uh, sold through his catalogs, the only extant pictures of them are pictures from his catalogs. And those are you know, sort of form the, uh, the only way that we know what these iris really look like. And in general, his pictures were really good and the color was really nice on them with one exception, the green iris. Here's a picture of green pastures from uh, Heller 1945. And believe me, it does not look like that. Um, for some reason, all of the pictures of green iris in his catalog were these very garish, vibrant green. And I can imagine that an awful lot of people bought these iris based on the catalog pictures and were severely disappointed. <laughs> you know, Joe Gio tells a story about that where he, I think it was even green pastures that he ordered from the Austin catalog and never ordered another thing from him again. So anyway, before we start diving into a little more detail about some of uh, Austin's iris, are there any questions or chats for me? I don't uh, have any yet. Okay, great. I will keep keep on going then. The thing that uh, Lloyd Austin is probably his most lasting legacy, in addition to the space iris, space age iris, he's well known for would be um, what he did for Errol and Errol bred iris. And you can see here a, a, a photo of his 1951 catalog. 1951, the Onco year for everyone. And this is the first catalog of his to pick to have a picture of an iris on it as opposed to a generic line drawing. And it's a picture of an aerial species iris. So before we get into what he did for aerials, let me make a brief digression and tell you a little bit about aerial iris. Um, in case you're wondering, the reason they are called aerials is based on their seeds. This is a picture from the AIS wiki of an oncocyclus seed. And you see it has this little pale colored collar at the end of the seed, and that's called an aril. And that's why these iris are called aril iris. And if you look at a tall bearded iris seed, for example, you just see a little, a little brown nubbly thing without this little collar on the end of it. So there are two main groups of aerial species. Um, the first one is are the Oncocyclus iris, and these are iris that are native to the Middle East. Uh, Austin referred to them as the iris of Palestine. And these are you know, true desert iris. Um, they have a lot of fairly specific um, culture, culture requirements in order to grow them. You know, they, they get summer water, they'll die, you know, that sort of thing. So they're not easy iris to grow for most of the United States. And the uh, second type of aerial species are the Regelia iris. And these are native to the Near East and Central Asia. And uh, Lloyd Austin referred to them as the iris of Turkestan. And the Regelias are a little more forgiving of uh, temperate climates. They're easier to grow. Um, you don't have to withhold water from them in the summer. And so these were the first things that Lloyd Austin really started concentrating on were these aerial iris and the aerial species iris in particular. You know, one of the most important things that he provided for um, the iris world was, um, let me set the stage for you. And you know, it's just after World War II and the stocks of aerial iris in both the Middle East and in Europe have just been decimated by the war. And none of, none of the old sources are available. And what Lloyd Austin did was he went and found new sources for these aerial species iris and he brought them into the US. 
And you know, by the end of his life in 1963, you know, he was he and his catalog were the main source for nearly every aerial species iris that existed in the U.S. So here, would, um, in addition to just importing these these exotic species, he was also interested in hybridizing them. And here we see uh, the front cover of his 1957 catalog, and it has a picture of his introduction, Judean bronze, um, which is an oncocyclus hybrid. It's the uh, cross of two aerial species, Iris hanii and Iris or Aronatica. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And so one, one of his main um, contributions was to, you know, do these hybrids of these onco species and then um, put them up for sale. And um, he was also experimenting with crosses between different types of aerial species. For example, here in the 1956 catalog, we see Persian lace, which is an oncogelia hybrid. And what that means is it has an oncocyclus pod parent and a regelia pollen parent. And one of the things that he was particularly responsible for was rediscovering and publicizing the fertility of the regeliocycli, which is sort of the opposite of an oncogelia. A regeliocyclus has a regelia as a pod parent and an oncocyclus as a pollen parent. So in addition to these, you know, selling aryl iris species, selling aryl iris species hybrids, he realized that that was really a niche market because only so many people could, in so many areas, could grow these specialized iris. So he also became interested in what are called aryl bred iris, where you're crossing the aryl species with regular tall bearded iris. And here's a few examples of his aryl breds. This is real gold from 1952. This um, has Capitola as one of its parents, which is a very famous um, arrow bred iris parent. And this is one of the few of its children that's in a sort of yellow color scheme. Most of them, most of Capitola's offspring are in, in the blue color stream. And this is another one of his arrow breds called Gold of Ophir. Um, this one is a pretty good grower. Um, and he mentions in particular this iris in his autobiography as being one of his favorite arrowbred introductions. This is Giant Moor, which is uh, Austin 1958. In addition to arrowbreds, he also just introduced just collected species. For example, this is Turkish topaz uh, from 1962 which is a collected regelia hybrid. It's a terrific grower. Um, if you, if you want to buy one pure aerial iris to grow, this would probably be the one. Um, it grows well for me in California. Um, I first saw it at a Superstition Iris Gardens in the uh, Sierra Foothills, and it was growing so well there, it practically naturalized. So real super grower. Gene, I do have a, uh, a question or two. Okay. And basically it's the, it looks like it's pretty much the same question is um, uh, where did, did Lloyd um, get the aryl iris, the species? And I guess that was one, uh, one question and the next person uh, said, who was the source of the aryl red species? So. And unfortunately, I do not know the answer to that. Um, I suspect he had contacts either in, probably in the Middle East directly, um, but I, I, I don't know. And I know there's some, you know, a lot of aerial experts on, on the call tonight, and if any of them happen to know, I, I'd love to hear, but I don't know myself. Okay. Okay, that's so. That's all I have. That's okay. Um, we were talking about rebloomers. Um, how far did I get before I froze? <laughs> Um, I, I had been talking about how, you know, Lloyd Austin really um, felt that the general gardening public um, would be much more interested in iris um, if, there, if there were more rebloomers available. 
he was also interested in improving, you know, the form and um, appearance of reblooming iris. Um, and he talked a great deal about rebloomers in his catalogs. Uh, he gave a lot of specific information about uh, which months particular iris, iris would rebloom, which is very uh, useful for uh, the assisting, assisting potential buyers and knowing if they would be likely to rebloom in their area. You know, if you're in Minnesota, you probably don't want a December rebloomer, for example. And he spent a lot of time in his later years concentrating on hybridizing reblooming iris. So let me go on and show you a few pictures of some of his reblooming introductions. This is, uh, I believe, his very first rebloomer introduction. This is Thanksgiving Firelight, which is a very nice um, you know, yellow over red combination. Um, you know, maybe a little bit. Uh, narrow in appearance for 1950. And you'll see that as a trend in a lot of the Austin introductions is, you know, the form of the iris is maybe a little bit old fashioned compared to a lot of contemporary iris. And this is Autumn Delight, which is uh, introduction from 1952. And in this one um, is Winter Flame from 1953. This one is a particularly good grower in rebloomer. Um, yeah, I, I grow this one myself and uh, it's a good grower. Blue Surprise came along in 1957, and this is another very good grower and rebloomer. I like the name, you know, sort of surprise, it's blooming again. And this is Dark Mystery from 1962. Um, this is another one I'm very fond of, and it's a good grower for me. And it's, you know, sort of interesting interesting color combination too with you know very deep um dark crimson in the falls and then the lighter standards in 1963 he introduced autumn rosy cheeks which um, again is a very unique color especially for a rebloomer and i like the sort of wash of the darker darker pink around the beard and then fading to the uh, lighter pink on the falls this one is Exotic Fire from 1964. And I see this one in a clump. It has a very, very nice clump effect with that bright yellow beard really stands out against the, uh, the dark red standards and falls. And a number of these pictures, you may notice these little, little dots on the, on the flowers. Um, the iris pictures, a lot of these ones that I took were taken in in a uh, iris garden with a lot of pine trees. And so the, the little dots you're seeing on the flowers is pine pollen. And this is from the same year, 1964, Crimson Repeater, which is another, <clears throat> another nice red rebloomer iris. And this is Chestnut Cheeks from 1965. And this one is also kind of unique in that it has these sort of chestnut shoulders on it while the, uh, and, and otherwise fairly pastel iris, which is a nice color combination. Another one from 1965 is Winter Gold. And this is another one that has been a good grower for me. And a nice yellow reblooming iris. So in addition to um, his, arrow, his arrows, his arrowbreds, and his rebloomers, um, Lloyd Austin also introduced a number of novelty iris. Um, here is a page with two of his um, flat iris introductions, Clementina and Giant Clematis. And I don't, I've not grown these myself, but I have heard that maybe in reality, they didn't bloom quite as flat as they appear in these pictures all the time. Um, so how flat were these flatties? Well, maybe some of them weren't all that flat. And I know that this is an issue with flat iris in general. So in addition to arrows and arrowbreds and rebloomers and a few novelty iris, uh, he might also introduced quite a number of just plain old tall bearded iris. And some of these were you know, very nice iris and good growers. 
you can see on the cover of his 1959 catalog, um, Flaming Gold, which is a tangerine bearded yellow. And here it is in real life, or at least in a picture. And he worked quite a bit um, with the tangerine bearded pink iris, which you know were quite new and exciting at that time in the 50s. And uh, he based a lot of his breeding programs on those iris. Here's uh, one of his tangerine bearded pink intros, Pink Symphony from 1957. And here is probably the most famous of Austin's you know, regular tall bearded iris. This is Tangerine Carnival from 1957. Um, this is quite a good grower and really makes a striking presence with those you know, long reticulations on the falls. He also introduced a lot of red iris. Um, this is red mahogany from 1963. And he introduced a lot of iris with very large flowers. Um, this is Crimson Colossus from 1963, and it really is a very quite large flower for a tall bearded iris. And uh, this is another one is another one of his, which is quite a good grower. This is Claret Mahogany from 1964, and this this grows almost like a weed for me. And this is another one of his large flowered iris. This is Jumbo Rose from 1964. And it's got pretty pretty good form for the 60s, but maybe not quite up to the you know state of the art of the day. And this one here is one of my favorites of his tall bearded iris. This is Black Sultan from 1966. And this is another one that makes a very striking clump and you know gives er, really striking appearance. So um, before I dive into the things that um, Lloyd Austin is probably most known for, are there any other questions or comments? No, I don't see any more. Okay. So when you mention Lloyd Austin, Austin to most Irisarians, um, what they think of are space agers. And it's interesting that he came up with this, this uh, term that he called them, you know, space age iris before there really was a space program. And in his autobiography, he said his hybridizing goal was to develop wings that make them look as if they're ready to take off into space. And one, one of the other kind of endearing aspects of his catalogs is that he had poetry in them. And a number of poems appear in his catalogs that were written by George Rees, who I believe was the brother of the famous hybridizer Clara B. Rees. And this is one that he wrote for Space Age Iris, Winged Iris for the Age of Space. This is indeed the age of space and all things must conform. The people, planets, even plants must rage, range beyond the norm. So Rainbow Gardens debutants zoom like a missile storm. So an interesting thing about the Space Age Iris and how he developed them was that the original progenitor of Space Age Iris was, wait for it, Sidney B. Mitchell. Interesting, you say. And what happened was, Sidney B. Mitchell had an iris, a seedling in 1944, um, later introduced the next year as Advanced Guard, which is a nice little placata iris. And if you look at the close-up of the beard, you see at the very end of it, there's this little projection, a little nub. And, and Sidney B. Mitchell himself, who was a, uh, a hybridizer of some note in the uh, Berkeley area, as I mentioned before, he wasn't really particularly interested in pursuing breeding for these funny little nubs on the end of the beards. So he gave the iris to Lloyd Austin in 1944 to work with. And in, he was, Lloyd Austin, you know, made self crosses of this iris. He also used a similar seedling that Sidney B. Mitchell passed along to him that had a similar little projection at the end of the beard. And, you know, after several years of working on this iris breeding line he produced in 1954, Unicorn, the world's first horned iris. 
And here is the picture on the cover of his 54 catalog, of course. Um, notice that he's now referring to himself as world headquarters for unusual iris. Here is a picture of unicorn in real life. Unicorn is actually quite a good grower. Um, and so if you're interested in some of these early space age iris, that's a good one to start with. And here's uh, another, another nice poem from George Rees. And this is the introduction page from his 54 catalog. And you notice that he's selling this for the, at the time, princely sum of $100. And if you look in the fine print under hybridizing possibilities, one possible reason that he was selling it for so much is that it had its maiden bloom in 1953, the year before. So chances are he didn't have much of any stock of it. So maybe he figured if he made it such an exorbitant price that no one would actually want to buy it until maybe the next year when he had more stock of it. And in fact, if you take $100 and 1954 dollars and adjust it for inflation, that would be $1,000 today. So the next time you want to complain about those, you know, Shriner in intros that cost $65, well, could be worse. It could be a thousand. <laughs> so after he um, got started with Unicorn, he um, actually had several seedlings from the same cross that produced Unicorn um, produced um, other intros. Um, this one here, Plume Delight, which he introduced in the next year, is from the same cross as Unicorn. And it's a very another very nice placata. And it has, you know, not fuzzy horns like Unicorn, but it's got these just naked appendages at the end of the beards. And this is another nice iris of his. This is from 1957, Horned Skylark. In 1958, he introduced Horned Rosy Red. You may notice a pattern with a lot of these names. It's, you know, sort of horned uh, adjective. And there's a nice close-up of the, the beard on Horned Rosy Red. And you can see these sort of interesting, you know, appendages with little things growing out of the end of the beard. And this is a, <clears throat> another handsome iris from this same time period, uh, Horned Ruby Falls from 1958. In 1960, he introduced Pink Unicorn, which um, is another one that um, sometimes tends to have these sort of naked horns at the end of the beards, although sometimes they have fuzzy beards all the way to the end also. And Pink Unicorn is a very good grower. So, you know, it's another one that if you want to start off with these iris, that's a good one to grow because it grows quite well. And also that year he introduced Horned Amethyst, which is you know, a very nice, nice sort of lavender purple color. And I just want to call out something, maybe wearing my hat as AIS images coordinator for a minute, um, just how different these two iris appear, even though we know it's the same variety. And it's just an example of the kind of effect that lighting can have when you take pictures of iris. And, you know, something to keep in mind when you're taking pictures. Um, I find that the best light for taking accurate color pictures is in bright shade. So that's not always available, of course. Sometimes, you know, the day that you're at the garden, it's, you know, blazing hot and, you know, not a cloud in the sky. And so you work with what you have, of course. So here's another one that came from that same um, cross as Unicorn and Plume Delight. This is Spooned Phantom from 1960. And this is the first, uh, one of the first iris that uses spooned in the name. And so one would expect to see spoons, you know, little tiny petaloids at the very ends of the beards. And in fact, um, this particular flower doesn't have any. And this sort of points out an issue with a lot of these early space agers is the, uh, the appendages on the beards were not always very consistent. And this, that can be um, a problem even with modern space age iris, but it was um, definitely more of an issue with these earlier ones. 
This is Horn Mystery from 1961. Another very striking iris with that, you know, bright white beard over the uh, dark, dark reddish purple falls makes a, a very striking presentation. And this is horned papa. And in this particular picture, it doesn't have any horns at all. It just looks like a tall bearded iris, um, but it was a space ager, um, perhaps one with not terribly consistent appendages. And he called it horned papa because of um, the fact that it had very fertile pollen and it is used in the background of a lot of his subsequent space age iris. And as I mentioned earlier, he also used a lot of tangerine bearded pinks in his breeding program. And that was especially true with his space age iris. An iris that he used quite extensively in breeding is Happy Birthday um, by David Hall in 1952. And you'll see that in the background of a lot of his space age iris. So we get to 1961 and we start seeing the flounced iris. And here we have the appendages in flounced premier in 1961 was not just a little petaloid at the end of the beard, but a whole big, almost like an, another petal itself, which he referred to as a flounce. And here's another one from 1961 flounced marvel. And this one's particularly interesting to me because you're starting to see um, iris with you know, somewhat more modern form in the space age iris. You know, these ones have quite a bit of ruffling. Even the flounce has, has a lot of ruffling on it and the falls are, are a little bit wider than we see in some of the early space age iris. Then again, in 1962, he introduced horn tracery, which again is sort of more of this sort of throwback form with you know, fairly narrow falls and a little bit of uh, open standards there as well. And this is from 1962, also white unicorn. You see a very nice close-up of the beard on that, which another one with the sort of naked appendages on it. He introduced a, a whole range of unicorns. There was pink unicorn, white unicorn. I think there was a red unicorn and a green unicorn also. And here's one from 1963 called Spooned Lace. And yeah, if you, it's, it's not up to modern standards of lace, but you do see that the edges of the, of the petals do have a little lace on them. What you don't see in this particular picture is much of a sign of any spoons. It's a very nice horned iris in this picture. And again, you know, appendages weren't always the most consistent in these early space agers. This is fringed flounce from 1963, which you know I, I like how that appendage goes straight up like it's taking off into space. And this is one of my favorite of the Austin space agers. This is horned flamingo, which is a really nice flamingo pinky orange kind of color. It's a quite unusual color. And this one is also a pretty good grower. Jean, there is a yes. question since we're talking about the flounces and appendages. Mm -hmm. uh, it says these pictures show a great consistency in the appendages on the same flower. Were his iris particularly good in this area? Um, for the most part, yes. Um, you will occasionally see one where, you know, in a particular flower, one, you know, one petal has a horn and one doesn't, or those sort of things. But for the most part, for a particular flower, the appendages were reasonably consistent. Where you'd sometimes see inconsistency is over the course of a stalk, where you know maybe some of the flowers have nice appendages and maybe some of the later flowers in the bloom sequence don't. But yeah, for the most part, they did. Thank you. So this is horned flare, which is another one I think is a very handsome iris. I've been trying to grow it and it's being a little reluctant, but it's still hanging in there. But I really like the, the blend of the pastel colors in this one and, and the flaring falls, which is, I assume, where the name comes from. Now this is Black Hope, which is probably my favorite of the Austin Space Agers. Um, it's just a, a really nice grower, and it's got I, what I think is a really beautiful flower. Um, the, the large picture 
shows the horns as just laying down flat. A lot of the times, as you see in the inset of the close-up, the horns will, the appendages will sort of take a take a right turn and start growing straight up. Uh, Jean, one mm -hmm. question on that one, just looking at that picture. Um, did he, do you know if he named it Black Hope because of the, the buds? The buds look very dark. I don't actually know how he came to that, how he came to that name, but that's a good guess. <laughs> so this is Frounced Frivolite. I think that's how you pronounce that. Flounced Frivolite from 1964. And now we've got some sort of crazy things going on with the beards here. Um, it's sort of bifurcating into all kinds of wacky directions. And this is Horned Dragonfly from 1965. And this is a very nice iris. It's got a little bit smaller flower than some of his other uh, tall bearded space agers, which I think gives it a nice compact appearance. It's a really just a good looking iris and with the uh, a lot of visual interest with the uh, reticulations on the falls. And here's a 1965 spoon blaze. And hey, look, it's got actual spoons on at least one of the petals. Um, this is an example of one that maybe isn't quite consistent over the course of the entire flower. And it's a nice little sort of lacy edging on the edge of the falls as well. So here is Magic Rosette. Um, and now we're getting into things almost in the pom-pom kind of territory where you have your flounces that have, you know, sort of multiple petaloids um, forming the flounces. So it's really, uh, to me, a real shame that he passed away when he did. And he, he died suddenly, it was unexpected in 1963. So he never, I think, got a chance to really realize the potential of the uh, space age iris. And, and the, he never achieved a lot of success in terms of awards and such in his lifetime. And I think he would have been extremely tickled to see space age iris win the Dykes medal, you know, 30 years on. So that's pretty much the presentation I had for you. I just like to, pay special attention to the folks who provided the pictures for me. Um, as you can see from the credits, the vast majority of the pictures are from my friend Gassine Lohr and from Mary Hess at Bluebird Haven Iris Garden. You know, I'm very indebted to them for sharing their beautiful pictures with me. Now, if you're uh, interested, you have, yes. Uh, I have a question for you. Um, do you know by any chance if, if Monty Byers was inspired um, by um, by him, or because they're from different eras, I believe. Monty yes. Barton was much younger, so I don't think they met because it would have been impossible, I think. But do you, do you know anything about that connection? I, I I actually don't know, and you know there may be some folks on the call who who you know were friends with Monty and may be able to answer that. Um, and I I would assume that he must have used them in his breeding program, but I don't actually know. Mm -hmm. There is a, a question in the chat as well, um, and I'm not sure if I can read this right, but it says, if there was a mutation in S.B. Mitchell horned iris, how come we get spoons and flounces? Well, what I think was going on there is um, Austin did a lot of line breeding, you know, crossing, making very, very narrow crosses to try to accentuate the, uh, the genetic differences. And he was you know, well-trained in genetics. So I'm, I'm sure he knew the best way to approach that. And so I think that was just the result of a lot of line breeding brought out sort of further enhancements and mutations of the original sort of nubs at the ends of the beards. Um, another question, Gene, how accepted was his work at that time? I mean, were people <laughs> excited or they said, no, that's not an iris or uh, well, how, how did they react? I mean, you know, a number of his iris had wide distribution. So that's one measure of acceptance. If you look at AIS awards as a measure of acceptance, they, they were not very well accepted because they didn't win a lot of awards. 
So, you know, a lot of people today, you know, hate space age Iris. And it's one of those things you either love them or hate them, I think. Right. <laughs> someone, someone asked, uh, says, could I see the pick of the catalog with, um, let's see, I lost it here, with the unicorn on the cover again. Okay, let me see if I can do that easily. And, and by the way, those uh, catalog covers are beautiful. I, I, he, he really understood graphics and visual. You know, love them, love them. Visual the impacts. Yes. Yeah, the rainbows, the colors. Yeah. And, and the way he utilized, utilized color to accentuate the iris uh, mm -hmm. types, right? Right. It's... So, yeah, here's, here's another picture of the 1954 cover with the unicorn on it for whoever requested that. Mm -hmm. So let me just Good. jump back here to my, looks like we have a hand up. Um, yeah, a couple of them now. So uh, Joe uh, Watson. I live in region five, which is Georgia. Um, I love this type iris, but do you ha have any recommendations of any of these that you've shown tonight that might live in our area. There, some of the older things are difficult for us to grow. Like my mother had something years ago named Fleet Mower, but I lost it and I can't find it. I would love to find another source for Fleet Mower. I would love to have that iris, um, who was named after William Moore's wife, who was another hybridizer in my area. Um, generally, I think arrow breads do not do super well in, in the Deep South. Um, if you're interested in space age iris, I would try maybe unicorn, pink unicorn, or black hope. I think those are the three that are the best growers, maybe horn flamingo also. And a lot of those are available in, con in, uh, in commerce fairly readily. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and Gassine has her hand up. We should be able to share PDFs of, we've scanned, I think, nine uh, or more of the Austin catalogs, and it should be trivial to figure out how to share them, whether put them on the AIS website or put them somewhere and uh, have a link to them. Uh, that will be fantastic. Um, also, um, I believe, uh, Jean, you have written for the blog, right? So maybe you can use those same uh, images for the blog and do a nice um, article with those catalogs. That, that would be beautiful. Okay, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, the other yeah. thing is that uh, the um, AIS Encyclopedia Wiki has about 4,000 uh, catalogs scanned. Um, and it, some of those may be there already. Uh, I, think there's, I think there's six Austin catalogs on the wiki already, but mm -hmm. um, I would be happy to, to upload any of the ones that I have that aren't already there. Yeah. And I, I believe Bob Prius is here, so he can probably tell us. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure there's, there's several on the, uh, in the library. The nice thing about the library is if the ones are there uh, and they came from the Biodiversity Heritage Library, which probably the later ones haven't, uh, the images can be easily copied. So you can copy the image of the catalog cover if you want uh, from the uh, library. And there's, there's now 5,000 catalogs in the library. That's the online library on the encyclopedia. Correct. But but uh, Gazine's offer is accepted. <laughs> so I just wanted to point out one uh, really excellent source if you're interested in Lloyd Austin Iris, and I know she has um, some of his arrowbreds, a lot of his rebloomers, and a lot of his space age iris. Is a Bluebird Haven Iris Garden, um, BluebirdHavenIrisGarden.com. And I think she's no longer taking orders for this year, but um, if you're interested in these iris, keep her in mind for next year. And uh, just finally in closing, I would also like to thank my research assistant, Emma Sophia, who provided um, <laughs> lots of helpful assistance. <laughs> thank you very much for listening. <laughs>